Well, hello everyone. I'm going to try to speak loud enough. Uh, my name is Juan. I'm with the EduNext crew, and I'm presenting this talk called Nonlinear and Dynamic Path Learning Paths. Well, we all know uh, Open edX and Studio uh, are great for building courses that are structured um, in a structure uh, composed by sections, subsections, and units, and those units. Uh, normally will be consumed by the learners in a linear way, right? What I want to talk about is some explorations we've done uh, that allow us to break that linear structure in a very lightweight form uh, and have some variety, add, to, so add some vari variety to it uh, so that the users can consume the contents in a non-linear, uh, more dynamic or flexible way. Uh, this I'm sorry. These experimentations have been done over like the past year in our playground, so to speak, which is a multi-tenant installation we hold where we serve something around 50,000 students and we've uh, had like 40 courses. Uh, and what I want to present to you is four specific cases with a very particular example and hopefully at the end one real life example. So let's just begin. The first uh, case would be like a free, free exploration. What we do in this case is to break the structure and allow the user just to navigate the contents without imposing any particular uh, sequence or line. Let me just please log into the site and I will show you. Oh, shoot. Get the at. Okay. Oh, shoot. Good I'm not really a Mac user, so uh, I apologize for that. Right, make it huge. That's okay. You keep talking, I'll get right. it on the screen. All right. it's, I'm not, so sorry. it's not displayed yet. Watch out. Keep talking. Okay, so I'm sorry about this. Keep. So, what we're going to do is to, uh, okay, that's perfect. Thanks a lot, sorry. Okay. Wow, this is going to be difficult. Here we go, I'm sorry. Okay, so as I was saying, the first case is just break down, the uh, eliminate the structure altogether and have the user choose whatever he wants to consume first. In here, we just give them the opportunity to go and, and come back from some particular mapping with the contents, right? That's case one, which is pretty simple. Now, case two would be a choose your own adventure kind of course where the user is presented with a choice after some courses, some con course contents, the user will be presented with a choice and he can decide where he wants to go next. And that would be something like this. Uh, which one do you want to, show to go next? I'm in this node, so to speak, and I have three choices. If I choose the one, I don't know, the third one, for example, then there is some JavaScript redirection that will get me to the next a set of content and in here I will have another choice to make after I consume the contents and in that way I will have a personalized learning path if you will. Uh, for implementing this we're using the, the hints capability of the, of the problems in OpenEx. Alright, so next case, the third case would be the one based an adaptive path based on your answers as a student. So what we do here is we present the content and afterwards we pose a, a problem or a question to the student and depending on if the problem is answered correctly or not, you construct a binary tree and it allows you to move to a more complicated set of content or, or questions if the student is getting the, the learning outcomes right or 
uh, probably a deeper explanation or rewarding of the explanations if the users are not getting the learning outcomes. So for implementing this, we are using, sorry, We're using the conditional module, which is something that edX has, and it's available via the X, uh, OLX specification of the courses. And for those of you that haven't used it, the conditional module allows you to hide or show some particular content, depending on if the user answered correctly a particular problem. So this is what we're using here to actually uh, well. This is what we're using to choose the path. I'm going to move a little faster. Oh, this is so complicated. And finally, the fourth case, it's a case where we kind of profile the student based on some test questions we, we built specifically for that purpose. And after we have profiled the user, we recommend some learning path for, for he or she to follow. This was implemented using the, the custom input, uh, custom Python evaluated module that's available at OpenEdX. So those are the four cases I wanted to show. This is not working for me. Uh, and finally, I had some very interesting example to show you. Let me see if I can get that last one working. We can go to the last slide. I just want to go to the browser. Oh, this is so complicated. OK. So the real life example would be an X block we've built based on these principles that will allow you to do several things. For example, the user in this X block could, if I can zoom out a little bit. Can you help me zoom it out? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Get the whole screen working. Uh, like, what do you normally do? Control scroll or something. Nice. No, but the whole screen. Oh, you want? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I think so. Okay. So what we can do with this X block, or the user can do with this X block, is first of all watch his progress, depending on the different grade type. And in a way, this could map their learning objectives, how he's getting or not the learning objectives. He can get some customized messages from the structures. And also, he can visualize graphically in a nice, sweet way the learning paths or choose, finally, choose, depending on all these three inputs, the learning activity or content he wants to follow. That would be like the main idea of it all. Well, thanks for listening. Sorry for all this logistics inconvenience. I hope it was clear enough. sorts of crazy things here. Um, okay, I'm not sure what that we finished downloading your video. Mm. <coughs> Hope it's in there. You guys didn't try opening it? I don't know. I didn't know I was running this show until I got here. Okay. Mm. It looks like it's Okay, hello everybody. Can everyone hear me? All right, um, so my name is Nate Ani, and the title of my talk is Learning is Not a Spectator Sport. Uh, so just a little bit about uh, myself. Um, I've been an uh, open source developer for a very long time. Um, for 10 years, I was the president of uh, Jazz Carta, which is a, a Python web development firm. Um, I got started with edX in 2013, working at edX. Um, and presented, some of you saw my uh, lightning talk last year on Docker. Um, I also worked with Stanford on the, um, the uh, Open edX Gap Analysis Report, with some of, which some of you may have read. Um, and these days I'm the founder and CEO of AppSembler. And what AppSembler is, is a solutions provider. Um, we're specializing in the Open edX, uh platform. That's all we do. Um, that includes customization, implementation, hosting, support. Um, we also work very closely with, uh, with the edX team. Um, we're based here in, in uh, Boston, Cambridge. 
Um, and those are just a few of our customers. So on to my talk. Um, so this is how most of us were schooled, right? This is how we, when we were in high school or college, um, you know, we're in this big classroom, the professor's lecturing to a big group of passive students. And if they're lucky, the, the professor is uh, calling them out and asking them questions to keep them engaged. And you can see this guy in the back row, he's, he's uh, struggling to stay awake. So then along came MOOCs, and everyone got excited about how they'd be so much more engaging for the students. So what did we do? <laughs> Honey, I shrunk the lecture. <laughs> so we look at the same content, and we put it online, and we call it a day. Um, so sure, there's many MOOCs that you know, include activities such as questions, and you know, students um, can answer those questions and problems they can solve. Um, but you know, the, the idea of scaling the best lectures is a compelling feature of MOOCs. However, in contrast to the passive form of learning by watching video lectures or reading text, um, the learning theorists have recommended a more active learning by doing. So we heard about this this morning, and if you, if you heard Mitch Resnick's talk, you know, project-based learning is really key. So many argue for learning by doing, as it focuses on the authentic activities that are more representative of the knowledge that we use in the real world. So I want to give you a concrete example. Um, one of our customers, InterSystems, they're here today uh, in the audience. Um, so they're a 30-year-old company. They've got lots of software products. Um, and they've had very successful classroom training. Um, in fact, a very high customer satisfaction rating for their classroom training. But they had a problem. Um, it doesn't really scale well. Right? The class size is limited. You can only send so many students to classroom training, and it's expensive. So you know, this is kind of what you know, InterSystems has, has been training their customers in a traditional classroom. Um, their classrooms look a lot better than this, by the way. Um, but they're trying to make this transition to online learning. So how can they provide hands-on labs, like what you get in a classroom, but in an online environment? So some of the challenges for InterSystems in providing these online labs is that they have very technical courses. And they need to provide a way for their students to get access to the software. They don't want the students to have to get a trial license or download software. They're really trying to avoid all the complexity um, of, of setting up this software. So Jim Breen, who's not here today, um, basically came to us and said, what we would really like is for our customers to be able to put their hands on our software you know, hands to the keyboard and use it. And so what we came up with is a way to deliver what we call virtual labs um, to the InterSystems customers using Linux containers. Um, some of you may have heard my lightning talk standing up here last year um, at the edX conference where I talked about the promise of Docker. Well, it's paid off by enabling us to provide a very rich learning environment where students can truly learn by doing. So this is basically how it works. Um, a student needs a sandbox environment in which to complete an exercise. And they simply click a button in, in a course in edX. And then a Linux container is provisioned for them in about 10 seconds with the software pre-installed and pre-configured. Student completes the exercise. And then the container is shut down. Or if you want, you can have it remaining if they're going to come back to it to do other, other exercises. Um, so this is what it worked. This is how it looks. There's a button right in the edX course. They click that button. And then about 10 seconds later, they get um, these two URLs back. And in this case, it's a developer course. So the student has both an environment to, to see the software running, as well as a, uh, a web-based uh, IDE, or integrated development environment. So they don't have to download any software. We're using something called Cloud9 for that. This is what Cloud9 looks like. It's a web-based uh, IDE. You can see that's the URL. So there's no software to download. And the student can actually do all the coding right in the browser. So I'm going to give a quick demo of how this works. If the demo works. Let's see. There we go. Um, so we're going to add this lab to our course. So we, we choose the lab, and we can see that that lab was actually created from a snapshotted container, ISC 1030 lab. And now we're going to take that, and we're going to add it to our edX course. So we go into edX. Uh, we choose the container launcher advanced module. And then we click Edit. And then here's where we paste in the name of the project. And if we want, we can choose a project-friendly name. 
sorry, I'm kind of a slow typer. And then we hit save. Um, and now you can see the button just changed to launch ISC 1032 lab. We publish that, we view the live page. And now in our edX course, we have this button that the student can click on and they instantly get, um, well, within about 10 seconds, they get that environment. They, they can click that link and they go right to the, uh, their personal lab environment where they can complete the course or complete the exercise. Um, so um, that's how we've done it for inner systems. And uh, has anyone seen the movie Inception? Yeah, it's, you know, I had this meta moment in the shower. You know, you, you have your, like, your, your best or craziest ideas in the shower. So I was thinking, what if we authored an edX course about developing on the open edX platform and provided an open edX development environment within an edX course? So that's what um, I'm proposing to do. Um, we're calling it right now A-Day, which is edX development environment. And it's basically a cloud-based development environment powered by Docker, which includes two things. It includes an open edX container uh, running in one container and a Cloud9 uh, IDE running in the other container. And these two containers are paired together by a shared volume, so basically the edX platform. And this allows you to, with one click, spit up a, a complete edX development environment in the cloud, no software installed, don't have to worry about Vagrant and Ansible and all this kind of stuff. Um, the benefits for this, it's dev stack without the headache. Uh, you can get started in 10 seconds. There's no software to download. Disclaimer, this is an experimental project right now. Um, so come and find me at the hackathon to get access to this environment and help us test it. So I think Ned just said I have two minutes for questions. No, I don't. Oh, you said I don't have. OK, come find me afterwards. All right, thank you. Presentation here in the Finder, right? Oh, that. What is it? Okay, that's. Yeah. This is in the keynote. How do I? Okay. This should work. Yes. Good. Go. Great. Be as loud as you can. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, can everybody hear me? Okay. Great. How is everybody doing today? So I'm going to talk about interactive open response answer assessment using uh, our proprietary virtual learning assistant technology. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Cogni. We focus on applying artificial intelligence to make learning more interactive. And if you have observed today's theme from the morning when Anand Agarwal said that um, video with multiple choice is not enough and we need to focus on higher quality assessment, which is already reflected in the subsequent sessions by other speakers. And so we are going to focus on how to enable that higher quality assessment in online education. So in online education, typically you will see three components. There is a platform such as edX, there is learning content, which could be videos or PDF or eBooks, and then there is an assessment. Assessment has not typically received as much attention as the other two components, and that's the bridge that we would like to fill uh, it has been very well um, been discussed and recognized by experts. Um, uh, Sanjay Sarma, who is the director of uh, MIT's Digital Learning Initiative and board member of edX, has uh, recently talked about the future of education. And he's uh, succinctly identified the problem with the success of online education, and that is the assessment and feedback. And the reason why assessment and feedback are important is because in a physical classroom-based education, we see that those are the two techniques or pedagogical principles that have been deployed um, uh, successfully, where a teacher is available to provide um, open response answer assessment and provide one-to-one -one tutoring and feedback whenever a student needs. Just uh, recently, uh, Ned talked about active learning. That's one of the reasons why we need open response answer assessment. But how do we enable that in the current setup? If we want to enable open response answer assessment, generally we would need to hire a number of uh, teaching staff to score and grade those answers. Um, but that's not uh, scalable, it's very expensive. Um, there have been some attempts to score open response answers and they haven't been very successful. So I'm going to present a different perspective um, can we take a look at what has been successfully applied in the artificial intelligence in the other industries? So many of you might have been familiar and already have used some of these products. 
These are called virtual assistants. They are available whether in consumer uh, web space or social media or healthcare professionals. They've been using it successfully to accomplish many different tasks. And wouldn't it be nice uh, if one of these products could be available to improve the learning interactions? So that's exactly what Cogni is. Uh, it's a virtual assistant designed exclusively to improve the quality of learning interactions. Hence it's called virtual learning assistant. It has two main functionalities, automatic assessment for open response answers, such as the one you see on the um, image on the right, and um, providing personalized tutoring through the AI technology. Uh, it relies on machine learning and natural language processing to go deeper inside the text that is generated by the student. Um, and rather than using the keyword-based analogy, it uses semantic technology to provide assessment that has been proven to be as good as human assessment in scoring these answers. So how can we apply this to edX environment? So for the sake of a demonstration, I've created a course about music harmony, music theory in the edX environment. It is a um, chapter called Fundamentals, and within that there is a topic called Harmony, and there is a learning content, and there are three types of assessment that I'll show you. One is the current edX ORA assessment, um, and next is the Cogni Enable Assessment using um, iframe and the LTI components. So if you were to implement an open response answer assessment today, you will see this kind of a screen interface. You will create an item that is an open assessment. And when you deploy it, the student would be able to see a similar kind of screen where they would compose an answer and they are ready to submit the answer. Uh, once they submit the answer, they have to go to the next step, which is learn to assess other responses. So they have to go through a couple of steps within that in order to be uh, eligible to assess other responses. And once they assess, uh, after that, they have to actually assess uh, several responses generated by other students, and then they would to assess their own response. Uh, until that point, uh, they, would, they would not be able to see a grade or assessment. So it's a quite time consuming and elaborate process. Um, how would it look like with Cogni? We enable different types of integration from a very simple iframe based in integration to LTI to Xblock or through the API, which can be used in any LMS. So let's look at the iframe based integration. Um, this is the staff view. They would be able to uh, generate this kind of an interface by using um, an iframe tool, and within that they have to go and edit, and within that they have to use the HTML editing, where they can plug in the URL of Cogni enable content, and then the student would be able to see it on their site, um, on the edX platform, the enabled version of the assessment. So here, a student is taking a question on what is musical harmony. Um, so they would first generate a response, and then they would submit it. And as soon as they submit the response, the assessment comes back in real time that uh, not only gives a score, but also provides a qualitative hint, um, similar to the one that was earlier shown by the OLI uh, people from the Stanford. But it, this hint is coming for an answer that is not multiple choice, but an open response answer. And with the help of this hint, the student can immediately reconstruct their an answer and submit again. And as they make progress, the system will keep provide feedback and until they learn the mastery of the topic. So that's one way of integration. The second way of integration is through an LTI plugin. So here you would be uh, generating an advanced um, tool from the settings and you will plug in the um, LTI endpoint of Cogni enabled item as well as the credentials that is given by us. And once it is done, the student would be able to see uh, on their interface a, a prompt where when they would click, they would be able to go to the Cogni site. Um, and once they are on the Cogni site, they would be able to actually interact. So I have a little 30 second video that will demonstrate how they can interact. So students are composing answers and as soon as they will submit, they'll get a real time feedback.
The other way of integration is through an API. We provide a RESTful API that can be plugged into any LMS. Um, it uh, takes a question ID and a student response and generates a score and a feedback that you can display depending on whether it is a formative assessment or a summative assessment. The API can plug into any platform. And in addition to scoring, we also generate analytics that shows how an individual student is doing versus how overall the class is performing. If you are authoring a course, you can rely uh, on Cogni to generate assessment items to measure different uh, skills like comprehension, summarization, inference, analysis, explanation, and problem solving skills. And you can use it across different uh, age uh, and grade levels as well as across different subjects and to measure different depths of knowledge. It complements the existing ORA system within edX very well because it uses more natural language processing, so it requires less number of training samples and provides more formative assessment. The technology has been proven uh, by academic research and publication that has been cited heavily by academic researchers and also validated by end users. Currently, Cogni is being used by students at several large universities and community colleges. And once uh, they used this technology, they uh, gave us a feedback. What did they feel about using Cogni? And they were very excited that it was able to provide real-time feedback and help to get them to the right direction. So it's uh, assessment plus the tutoring, which is uh, what the students love. So that's Cogni. We would love to work with uh, the ed edX ecosystem to enable more interactive learning and assessment. Thank you. Which one were you? She will launch a LibreOffice from the spotlight. Um, yeah, Just she like, you know, hit down. Did. But was it running? And it's right there. That's okay. You know how to use it. Here's a clicker if you want it. Oh, cool. Let's see here. Nope. Oh, wow. That uh, really changed up the font there. It sure did. That's okay. Go, go, go. All right. Hey there. My name is Jonathan Piacenti, and you may have seen me with the handle Calcatech on my pull requests. I'm one of the members of OpenCraft, and I'm here to talk to you today about open badges and why you should consider using them. First, a bit of background. Open badges are virtual trophies that you can get the students that allow them to showcase their achievements. They were developed as an open standard uh, in partnership with Mozilla, the MacArthur Foundation, and Hashtag. And they are independently verifiable, so they can't be forged. All of this is great, but you may be asking yourself, Wait, why? I can already do certificates. The answer? Because we are all drug addicts. Badges are based on the same reward mechanism hacking principles as other gamification projects. By giving the user a small shiny trinket that commemorates their achievement, you engage them to continue taking courses. In fact, to demonstrate this idea, I'll be giving stickers to anyone who asks me questions about badging after the talk. And I'm right here. <laughs> Gamification is great, of course, but you also get other benefits like branding expansion. A badge displays what your student has achieved through your program, and that means free advertising as they show off what they have accomplished. This also forays into the sphere of micro degrees as students can assemble their badges to show off their unique learning history in a way that's easily reviewed. So I'm going to give you an overview of how the current implementation for badging works. To create badges, you need an issuing server. Our friends at Concentric Sky have come up with Badger. Once Badger is set up, you set up your issuer. Your issuer is where you define your organization and write down some information about it so that people and software that examine the badges can look you up and learn a little bit more about you. Once you have your, isu your issuer, you create a specification for a badge. This is where you define the achievement that you'll be giving to students. In the current implementation, the LMS creates the badge specification automatically for you, writing down a bit of basic information about the course it will issue a badge for. Finally, when certificates are generated, badge assertions are created for each student. A badge assertion is the badge the student will earn and can take with them. It comes in the form of a baked image. 
which isn't quite as fun as it sounds. A baked image is an image file that contains JSON metadata detailing how to verify the badge and who it belongs to. This allows trophy case software to make sure the badge belongs to the user and that it really has been uh, issued by your organization. Speaking of trophy case software, Mozilla Backpack is the first and as far as I know the only one uh, site that allows you to display and showcase your badges in little co collections as you like. When a user earns a badge, they will also be given a set of instructions on how to upload it to Mozilla Backpack and show it off to their friends, family, and coworkers. Right now, the implementation is fairly minimal. There are a few things we'd like to add, and of course, open source contributions to add these things would be welcome. For instance, Mozilla Backpack has an API for submitting badges directly to them so they don't have to be uploaded by the user. At the moment, badges are only awarded by completing a full course. We would like to add more granularity, say for individual units or sections. Another current limitation is that all the courses share the same images, only differing per course mode, like verified or honor courses. It would be nice to have images that correspond to the specific course that the user has completed. And one more thing that would be nice is to have uh, images on the student dashboards and their profiles. You might be able to think of other ways to improve the badging service, and thanks to the wonders of open source, you can. That's all I got. If you got questions for me afterwards, I'd love to hear them. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nimisha Astagiri. Uh, I'm one of the uh, software architects here at edX and um, an engineer, software engineer uh, currently leading the mobile team. Um, <laughs> talking about accessibility, I mean that's one of our biggest focus when it comes to mobile. I hope my content that I'm speaking here is accessible to the people in the back. If not, I'm sorry, you can try to move up. Um, so uh, when, I, when I heard that there was a time slot to do this, uh, I thought, okay, fine, let me jump in. It's an opportunity to show my face because uh, this is great for, from an engineering perspective just to learn about all the things that you guys are doing. It's been great, all the conversations I've been having. And um, I've also been real, uh, really grateful to see that everyone's actually tackling similar problems that we're doing, we're tackling at edX in terms of the mobile perspective, but you know from different perspectives, different angles, a lot of you guys are, are tackling mobile, mobile first and that is awesome. You guys are thinking about education in a box, bite-sized content, geospatial content, um, you know whether how we, we come together in terms of mobile uh, from edX and your perspective or, or you guys we take different tangents, these are all experiments that we're doing. This is mobile providing providing mobile um, education to users and students in new and, and, and ways, so that is awesome. Um, from edX perspective, as all of you guys know, it's not mobile first. It hasn't been mobile first. However, now we, we started the mobile initiative last year, and uh, our current focus is taking the rich content that has already been provided um, uh, on our edX.org courses and making that available on mobile devices for our students and also students um, who may not currently be using it, but you know, to who are there using it globally. Um, so we're not currently tackling offline support um, except for videos. So the current app that is out there, what we have, what we have tackled initially um, was uh, a video specifically. And um, uh, once again, since it wasn't mobile first, there were a lot of things that we need to do in terms of video content. So we had our video team work on a video pipeline allowing the video content to be, uh, to, to provide different resolutions for video content so that it would be performant in downloading this on the mobile app and making it accessible. Um, with that, we've implemented something called a video abstraction library that allows, uh, allows us as developers to, um, you know, take a logical video um, but then have different encodings for that video, whether it's a high-end 
uh, mobile access uh, bandwidth that you have or a low, low resolution bandwidth, whether it's audio only. So that's also a capability that we want to try to put in as, as soon as possible. Um, the, our video team actually has created an, uh, audio and lo, and only encodings for the videos that are out there. We just have to make that available on our mobile app. Um, uh, what we are doing that is mobile first right now as edX as an o organization or engineering organization overall is making our API's mobile first. So we are thinking when we are now developing our API's as extension points to our uh, current uh, uh, um, current um, technical uh, availabilities that we have in edX, um, you know, we're making them with mobile in mind. We're trying to create RESTful APIs, and um, we're making them generic APIs so that it can be used for the open edX community overall. Um, so uh, the other the thing that we're tackling next, and uh, in, in a few weeks, we're, we're really uh, hopeful, hoping to, to release our assessments on mobile. And um, so there, we have uh, created APIs for allowing people to, um, to basically access X-Blocks. So you can have a standalone X-Block. You can access it through a, a URL where it will just display that X-Block in a responsive way. And uh, so that is, once again, work we've done for mobile, but could be now, once again, through our uh, public APIs become available. So you can use that in whatever app that you want if you want to just display one X-Block, whether LTI actually uses it in their LTI integration, um, and it's available for others to use. Um, our current uh, way of tackling Xbox on mobile is to do this through a web view. So um, we don't have native support for Xbox at the moment. So like I said, our, our primary initiative is making all of this available given the current rich content that's out there making that available on mobile. So the first phase that we thought uh, would be the best way of doing this was to provide this through a web view. Um, and, and so um, what we are what we are allowing Xbox developers is to tag their Xbox as responsive. So whether or not you have Creator HTML and JavaScript and whatnot in, in, in a responsive way, so that it is touch friendly, um, can also um, be be shown on smaller device screens and so forth. And if that is the case, then you can tag your Xbox, um, and therefore those will then appear on our mobile app. And um, let me see. So as part of this work, um, there's uh, a lot that, that went into this, and you know the mobile team has been working hard. And um, the thing is that what we've what we've done is these course blocks. We wanted to make them at least Xbox available on mobile. So what we have done is we made it in a performant way. Um, as part of that, what we've done is when you publish a course from studio or you know through OLX and whatnot. What we do is during publish time, we actually allow, um, we, 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 at that, that is a time when we actually access the database and the module store. Um, so this is what we're calling block transformer. So we've, we separate out of the phase where we collect all the information that course blocks want. Um, and then in a, uh, at the time when the blocks are needed on a user specific time, that's when we actually go ahead and make user specific transformations on those blocks. So a lot of this stuff is on our open edX wiki and you can find more information and also you can come and talk to me later if you want specific uh, information. But, um, but essentially we want to make sure that on the mobile apps, it's a student facing app, we want to support uh, A-B test modules, library content, cohorted content, basically providing content that is user specific. So. Um, in addition to that, there's a, a lot of other APIs that we're providing. We're going to be releasing discussion forums as well, and so we've, we've created RESTful APIs for that. Um, push notifications is another uh, feature that we're, we've, we've started implementing. We're using Parse as our distribution channel for that and, and Parse channels, and the reason we did that was because we wanted to be able to reach uh, users that are also in other networks like the Baidu network that's in China. So, um, but you can talk to me more about that. And, and um, uh, uh, actually talking about that, uh, so uh, Parse is also, also eventually bought by Facebook. And the other thing that we got inspired by Facebook is Facebook has put in a lot of effort on, on, on React and React.js. 
and they had just open source React Native for iOS and most recently React Native for Android. Now, where, how does this apply to you? Well, as Xbox developers that may be out there, we want to be able to eventually support native uh, development of Xbox. And one way that we're currently thinking is why not use Re React as the, uh, as the development tool for that. With React, essentially, you, 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 you develop in JavaScript. And uh, so if, even if you're not an Objective-C programmer or a Java programmer, if you're a JavaScript, you can write your JavaScript um, uh, you know, implementation for an X block, and then it can work on all these uh, different platforms. So anyway, so there's a hackathon project that we have uh, for, for trying this out as well. So um, okay, so it looks like I'm up. There's a lot more that we can talk about, but uh, essentially, uh, I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to uh, talk to you guys um, at the hackathon. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, ideas, and I'll be here around here today and tomorrow as well. So we should have Let's need a browser. Oh, oh you want good. a browser. Okay. okay. So my slides are on GitHub, so bear with me just a moment. Let's do it this way. Wish I had used a shorter name at this point. OK. Does that work? Amazing. Sweet. I'm going to have to click allow to get rid of that toolbar. At the top. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to carry this down here won't so, get rid so of it. it doesn't fall. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm Peter Pinch. I'm the Associate Director of Engineering at the MIT Office of Digital Learning. And one of the things you learn quickly at the MIT ODL is that we can't work on any projects unless they have an acronym. Um, so I'm going to try to tell you about uh, two things that we've worked on in the past year, uh, IDDE and CCX, uh, and a little bit of the underlying edX ar uh, architecture behind them. Uh, and I think I can do this in five minutes, but we'll see. Um, so uh, IDDE stands for Individual Due Date Extensions. Uh, and when you run a MOOC on a college campus, you realize pretty quickly that you need to be able to grant extensions to students. Um, so it's actually a pretty simple feature. Uh, and uh, it just allows the, an instructor in the course to change the due date for a single problem for a single student um, without changing it for everybody else. Uh, and this is a feature in Open edX now. Uh, I'm not sure it's actually documented anywhere, so one of the reasons why I'm talking about it today. Uh, and when you turn on the feature flag, it's available uh, throughout your installation, not available on edX.org for perhaps obvious reasons. Um, and I'm going to come back in a few minutes to uh, how this actually works. Uh, the other feature, which would take me a while to demonstrate, but I'll try to uh, talk about it a little bit here, is custom courses on edX. Uh, and this is an approach to having a very lightweight way to reuse courses. Um, so uh, we have a concept of a coach who can take an existing MOOC and for a limited set of students, uh, that coach can set dates uh, and also remove sections from the course. So the idea is if you have a 15-week course in uh, classical mechanics, uh, a high school teacher could reuse uh, week eight out of that. And instead of week eight taking just a week, uh, we can spread that out for those students into multiple weeks. Um, another key part of this is that the uh, coach isn't allowed to change the content. Uh, we don't want people changing uh, the courses that we created. Um, and again, this is a feature that is available in Open edX. I can't remember now if it's in Cypress or not. Maybe someone else can remind me. Um, it, uh, and it also is available on edX.org now. Um, yeah. uh, so uh, what do these features have in common? Uh, in both cases, we're trying to modify just a small bit of uh, 
information about uh, the X block. We just want to modify one field or a couple fields uh, and also for a certain set of users. Uh, and the way that we've implemented this uh, with a lot of help from edX is using this concept of uh, override. Uh, and when you turn on the feature flags for these features, what they do is they actually add these field override providers. So when you turn on individual due dates, it adds an override provider for uh, individual student override um, and similarly for CCX. And what these do is uh, for the users in question, they provide them a different view of the courseware. Uh, so in this example, for uh, individual due dates, uh, you've got uh, two different students, student A and student B. And uh, what's happened is the instructor has decided student A uh, on problem two, they had some kind of personal issue and they need a, the, the due date changed. Uh, so they enter that in. Uh, and then when student A accesses the courseware, it passes through, the request passes through the override provider. Uh, and problem one passes all the way through, but problem two, uh, it returns the overridden date. Um, student B doesn't have any idea that this is happening. They're stuck with the original due dates. Uh, the CCX example is a little more uh, complicated. There are more fields that we override. Um, we're also uh, taking advantage of uh, a unique uh, course key for CCXs so that uh, enrollments and analytics don't get mixed in with our original MOOC course. Um, but it's the same basic concept. That CCX student, uh, instead of seeing the original courseware with its original due dates and um, visibility, um, sees a modified version where the content all goes all the way through, but uh, due dates and uh, visibility are modified by the rules set up by the coach. And... That's it. I can talk a lot more about these things, but I just want to give you a taste. Uh, a lot of people worked on this, including, I have to mention, Jazz Carta um, quite a bit. Um, they had to write IDD twice. <laughs> uh, and um, also thanks to some key folks at edX, Cale Pennington, who came up with this concept and actually made it work for us, uh, and Dave, who made us do it the right way. <laughs> thanks. So in open office. Yes. Is that gonna work? Yes. Do you have a start? Uh, yes, if I have problem. Um not a Mac user. Not a Mac <laughs> user, okay. I'm not an open office user. Um so let's show start from okay. here. Use this to click forward. Okay. So hi folks. I'm Eugenie. I'm with OpenCraft and today I'm gonna talk about using nested X block and why do you want to do that? So the talk is mostly aimed to, um, for Xbox developers. So if anyone else, if anyone is not interested in that thing, you can like check your email or Facebook or do anything else. Um, so um, I'll skip some introductory material like what are Xbox and what are used for, and jump into the um, what are the use, um, what the main points for using the. Uh, nested X blocks. So it's like the one of the least used features of X block because I've did some digging and out of 200 X blocks available on GitHub, there are like three of them that actually use that. Um, two of them are built by OpenCraft and the third one was uh, received its last comment like in April 214, so it's probably not used anymore. So there can be two explanations to that. Um, your guy is doing something uh, really wrong and this feature is useless, or the feature is overlooked and it should be used more frequently. So I would argue for the later one, of course, um, and that nested X block have some unique benefits that 
uh, make developing and maintaining X blocks more fun and if you are paid for that more profit. So benefits. Um, the main benefits is it allows integrating other X blocks into your X block seamlessly. Um, it's really simple. Uh, you can easily embed video X blocks or discussion X blocks or virtually any other kind of X block into your own X block. So it allows mixing and matching the best EDXX system can offer. The second one, it really reduces code complexity provided you have really complex X block. So the good um, markers that you can benefit from that if the, you can distinguish a subset of features that plays really well together and mostly isolated from the other parts of X block. And there are some parts of, um, there are some parts that can be duplicated uh, tweaked, train ranged, and otherwise uh, authored by course authors or used by um, students. And it provides better author experience. Uh, so, oh yeah, right. One related consequence of code complexity reduction is that it allows splitting monolithic um, X block into a smaller X block. So you can have um, atomic handlers, uh, Ajax handlers and views on child level or aggregate uh, views and handlers on parent level. So uh, author experience, well basically how it's done before is providing some kind of XML or JSON or YAML based schema and uh, asking authors to provide XML to build uh, the X block content. Uh, the problem here is that the course author should be familiar with the markup language you're using and with the schema you're using. So basically what means what in your X block. Um, and the biggest problem is that there are little to no tools to support authoring, um, authoring the content in such case. So the best can be done is by validating XML, JSON, YAML when the X block is saved. And using nested X block helps combat that by reusing existing studio features. I was told that this screenshot is a little bit busy, so I'm gonna explain it a little bit more. So by existing studio features, I mean that there are those edit buttons that allow configuring X blocks and delete buttons. Do we have some laser pointer here? Yeah, we have. So edit buttons delete buttons, shouldn't, shouldn't shake like that, um, drag and drop stuff so it allows uh, rearranging blocks and this big stuff, add new component which allows adding X blocks using the studio interface. So um, there are problems and caveats of course. Um, one of the biggest problem is front end code duplication. That's a problem that I don't have a good solution yet and I'm going to approach it in on a hackathon tomorrow. So if from everyone interested, feel free to join. Um, so when you have like 10 X blocks, this is, this feels natural to have um, dedicated CSS and JS files for those X blocks. And if you have common functionality or common uh, styling, there are no good way without the support for asynchronous model definition uh, to share those between the X blocks. And the only way to do that is to provide some global scope object and attach your common code to that. This have all of these advantages that AMD was designed to solve so I'm not gonna repeat it. You can see it on like required JS documentation or common JS or any other asynchronous model definition library. So next one, static asset slow eating. So when you have um, dedicated JS and CSS, it takes more browser requests or, so like there are two ways to embed JS and CSS into studio code. The first way is by actually embedding it into HTML that is outputted or by providing a link to download it at runtime like. And both ways have its disadvantages. Um, so basically embedding prevents browser from caching it. Uh, while loading via URL adds additional requests so it may slow down the load time 
And as a good starting point to optimizing this, I would suggest embedding custom GS since they are really small usually, and loading vendor CSS GS via URLs. And the last one is more studio code. So when you have uh, more blocks, you should provide more studio code to um, allow configuring them. L luckily, those more studio code is actually basically the same code duplicated 10 times. And we have come up with a solution, which is XBlock Utils. It is uh, held over to EDX project and is available um, in upstream installations. And it helps by, yeah, that's, that can be seen. So it helps by, pro you can declaratively build your um, edit forms and add component uh, regions by providing like edit table fields and it builds uh, edit form using the metadata you provided. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so I'm actually here to present not my work, but the people who should be here to present this happen to not be able to be here today. So Andy Armstrong, Brian Talbot, Alistair, and Dennis are the engineering and UX team members from edX who can answer all of your detailed questions. But I just wanted to introduce at a high level work we're doing to help support uh, broader use and reuse of UX and UI patterns throughout the platform. So what is a pattern library? So it's a collection of UI design elements that are meant to solve similar problems. So you don't have to keep redesigning uh, for sort of the basic problems we already know how to solve. So examples of this, uh, MailChimp has uh, a really well sort of used and sort of detailed pattern library. Google has similar sort of examples. Apple has similar examples. And so it, it, the goal is basically to, to solve issues like this one. Hey, I want to draw at a drop down a page this. Where do you guys put that? Right? Or why do we have so many buttons? Right? So those kinds of problems are the kinds of things we want to solve with a um, pattern library. So why do we need it? Visual design consistency, interaction consistency, um, trusted sort of Lego style building, um, and then UI standards and guidelines. So I'll first point to work that the UX team, and in particular Brian uh, Talbot has, has spearheaded, which is a pattern library. So you can actually go to ux.edx.org and see kind of basic elements and sort of a preview of them, some actual markup, and then actually styling code associated with it. So these are not all buttons that are currently in use in edX platform. So there are some challenges to getting it in there sort of all in one shot. Um, but you can look at not only buttons but also all these other things, icons, headings, layout. Um, and the idea is that we take these little bits, these atoms of UI design and, you know, color and sort of layer them on top of buttons, layer them on top of other elements that are really washed out and not visible um, on the screen. Um, but you can see sort of messages and all these sort of more advanced patterns and you kind of move out of little atoms and into little molecules and eventually you build sort of bigger pages. Um, so the second part of this uh, from an engineering standpoint is we're layering a UI toolkit on top of this. So what does that mean? So the pattern library is a installable Bower package so you could put it on a separate IDA um, that you're building on a, um, to integrate with edX platform. And that was a bunch of jargon maybe for a bunch of people but um, this UI toolkit is the sort of JavaScript and UI pattern layer that will sort of grab that UX pattern library and use it. Um, so the hope is that we can actually begin to reuse patterns and sort of be able to build stuff out quicker uh, with, this, with this stuff. So uh, the two things I'll link you to are the pattern library and the UI toolkit which are just getting started. So you know it's very early, early stage so this is mostly early communication. And then those people you should talk to because um, they have way more details. And that's it. And they'll be here tomorrow. And they will be here tomorrow. And at the hackathon. Yeah. I don't have any slides. All right. 
Hi everyone, I'm DB. Um, I work on the open source team at edX. I have no slides, I have no notes, all I have is speaking extemporaneously. So I'm sorry if my presentation is a little bit disorganized, but I'm going to try to keep it fast. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about is I have been working on a, a theming feature for edX platform and ideally for all of open edX uh, comprehensively. And a lot of people might wonder, why do we need another theming feature for open edX? because right now we have two already. We have the Stanford theming system and we have the uh, microsites system. Both of these systems have problems. They were implemented by small specific groups to meet their small specific needs at the time, which is totally reasonable. But the problem is not everybody in the world has those same needs as those small specific groups. As a result, they have lots of issues. The Stanford theming system is really built on Ansible, which means that in the open edX code base, it's very difficult to understand how it works. And the microsite system only works in certain places that are specifically coded in. So if you want to themify something that is not already coded in, you have to modify the core templates, which sort of defeats the purpose to begin with. So I have a pull request that I'm working on for what we're calling comprehensive theming. And the reason why it's called that is because what it does is it allows you to override any template in the platform without having any sort of uh, setup required whatsoever. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to view the, the repository that I have at this point in time in my pull request. I should also point out this is not yet functional. We actually tried releasing comprehensive theming to edX.org about a week or two ago, and there were some problems, so we had to pull it back out. So I'm trying to rework it to get it back in. This is not yet functional yet. But the idea behind comprehensive theming is that you would have a theme directory, such as there would be an edX.org theme. And I also have a directory here that I'm just calling red theme, which provides some examples. Within that one theme directory, you could have several subdirectories which represent different parts of the system that can be themed. For example, your one theme could apply to the LMS and Studio and your certificates and any emails that are sent out by the notifier system and any other components of the system that you want to build. You would have one theme that provides a consistent look and theme across everything. That's the idea. Uh, within that, each one of these simply has a structure that mirrors the core templates and core images that are already been, being used by our system. So for example, uh, we just have a static images directory, and then, and then within that we have logo.png, which is the edX logo. And we would have within the core code base a corresponding logo.png, which is a non-branded logo, so that when you set up your open edX installation, it doesn't have any edX branded trademarked assets. So you could simply, if you want to override an image or you want to override some sort of static asset, you would simply drop it into your directory and make sure it has the same name. And when the system is looking to find that image or that static asset, it'll simply return your themed version before the core one in the platform. You can also do this with uh, SAS and CSS, which I have in this red theme thing. So the idea is that in static, you could have a CSS thing, which uh, you would name your CSS files in such a way that they would get picked up. Or if you want to use SAS, you can simply use the same names that we have for our CSS files and have an overrides directory and simply override the variables that you're interested in modifying. So if you want to have an installation of open edX that is, for example, red instead of blue, you could just override a couple of variables in this one SCSS file and the system would take care of recompiling all of your SAS with those overrides to make it red instead of blue. Um, you can also use the system for templates as well. So for example, I have a template here and I have header.html and footer.html. And again, the same way that it works with the images, the idea is that this system would simply look for a file named header.html or a file.footer.html and it would check your template directory first. And if it finds that, it would use that version instead of the version in the code base, in, in the core code base. And this is nice for a lot of reasons, including one, you can override any template and any asset in the code base without having to modify it first to stick in those extension points. And two, it's also a system that's a lot more consistent with a lot of other theming systems out there. Like if you're familiar with WordPress theming or Drupal theming, it works in a very similar manner. So this is still very much a work in progress, and it's something that is going to impact the two existing theming systems out there. 
We're going to try to preserve compatibility as much as reasonable. But as I said, these systems have problems. And so we're hoping that this new system is going to eventually replace them outright. But I'm looking for feedback, and I'm looking for people to help test the compatibility of the old theming systems with this new theming system so that we can make sure that anybody who's already using theming on their OpenEdX installation can still be supported. And that as we roll out this new theming system, we make sure that other people continue to have proper theming systems that work well, rather than us accidentally breaking other people. So again, I'm DB. If you have any questions about that, please come and talk to me. And I'm all done. We are going to switch computers. Actually, here, I'm just going to close this. You put yours there. Okay. Plug that in. So while Carl's getting set up, Carl is our last lightning talk speaker. The oh, thank you. The uh, reception is going to be starting at 5:15, right at uh, uh, the little lawn out here. If you were to walk back into the WAN building just before you got in the building, you would encounter the reception, and that's where it's going to be. And we're going to be hanging out there for I don't know an hour or something, um, just socializing and talking and enjoying the snacks probably. Okay, well, it's not, uh, it's not picking that up. Do you have displays going both ways? It's not. Oh, here, the show mirroring. Wait a second, this is upside down. Okay, yeah, maybe the other way. Crap. Yep, that should, that should work now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, All right, cool. Uh, thanks, Ned, and uh, thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to start out by this ritual that two billion people are wired into a new culture here. That before you eat, you take a picture and you post it on your Facebook, Instagram. You arrive at an airport, you take a picture and you say, "I'm here." So same thing I have to do. That you know, before I speak, I take a picture of my audience <coughs> and say, "Hey, I'm speaking at this conference." Right. But then, what do we do with those pictures? This is an education conference, so we got to have our own network. So I'm not uploading it. I'm not uploading it to Facebook or Instagram. I'm uploading to my to a knowledge network, which is EdCat. So when I post it here, and I say, you know, great conference, and and I hit uh, post, we'll see that it'll show up here. Now. Why do we need this? So at CAST, we are based in Silicon Valley. We are a knowledge network. It's an informal knowledge network on the layer on the top of the formal open edX course platform. And why do we need this? Well, what I just did is that you know, I pushed in a bite-sized content, whatever I learned. And this is just a picture, so it was just a little bit of a joke. But I can actually capture some bite-sized content, and I can post it on my site, on my page. Just like my Twitter page, I have an adcast page, at Carl Mehta. Anybody who is following it can learn from me in moments in bite-size. Also, I have live insights. So some of you who might have missed some of the speakers, but we were live streaming right from the app. And some of the speakers were upstairs, and they were live streaming their, their insights, and that goes up on the handle as well. So you will ask, why do we need this? You know, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have Instagram. Don't the world, does the world need still another social network? Well, a couple of points. Number one is that most of the 90% of the content that I see on the Facebook or Twitter or Instagram is, is not something that I'm interested in. And number two, I want to get all my learnings and all my knowledge into one area, which I can very easily navigate, and I can keep track of the analytics around it. What am I learning? And number three, the set of friends, the set of people that I learn with are sometimes different. They are not the friends or different set of groups. So there are lots of different reasons why I would like to have a knowledge network. But that's for me personally. Now you will say, well, I'm from university, and I'm from a corporation. Why do I need this? Well. Do you have examples of people doing it? Yes. 
So, you know, we have Fortune 500 company, which is Salesforce, and they run a network on the top of their formal course learning, which is slash Salesforce. You have, do you have a university doing it? Because, you know, universities won't buy anything until another university is already using it. So, do you have that? Yes, we have, you know, I'll show you a bunch of different examples for that. But the main thing that this social learning platform that EdCast has built on the top of the, the formal learning open edX is that it gives you daily engagement, which is very critical. So I'm sure all, all of you who have ran MOOCs, you know that the fundamental issue that you, 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 you struggle with is to keeping, making sure that the users show up every day and they're engaged. So bite-sized content, we have data running number of courses where we have completion rates in the axis of 50%, five zero, not one five. So 50% engagement rate, which is driven mainly by people wanting to stay in touch on a daily basis. They can just consume a little bite size, which could be a part of the course, which could be just a side conversation, or which could be even a live stream. The other thing is, why do you need this live stream? Well, one of the biggest obstacle or the hurdle for publishing more and more content on open edX or on course is the course development cost. Right, costs about $100,000 to get into a studio and all of that. Today, this technology is so well powerful, we have lots of videos just done from an ad casting app, and you can take 10 minutes videos and put, put them together into a collection, and you can post a course in like in few hours without spending not even a fraction of the money. So if you combine that ability to compress the development cycle in terms of courses, the ability to keep the users engaged, that's where you need the, the ad casting network. And let me quickly now just show you, uh, I wanna get off this show, and I can show just a quick video. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So yeah, this is what I wanted to show, that if you go here, this is my page, and you know when Beth was speaking, I took a picture and I posted on it, and people you know who are following me, uh, they get to see what's going on here. Uh, if you, this is the picture that I you know uh, I just took, but here is all the open edX interviews. So when you go back, you can go to edcast.com forward slash open edX, and there are about seven or eight interviews from speakers here that we were taking upstairs and you will learn a lot. These are all insights, short insights that you can plug it in and reuse it. Here is uh, Queensland University of Australia. Uh, here's Salesforce, how it is using it. Uh, I'll show you just a one 60 second video to see how in, in real life uh, it's being used. And uh, I think the audio isn't working here, so I'll see what's the max I can get you. Throughout history, the great minds who have changed our world have been driven by one fundamental value, a thirst for knowledge. People have been limited by what they can learn traditionally through books and physical classrooms. Many don't even have the opportunity or means to enroll in formal education. With the rapid proliferation of computers and mobile devices, anyone should be able to learn about whatever they desire. Until now, there hasn't been a way to bring it all together. This is EdCast, the best way to discover and keep in touch with topics that you are interested in. Whether you'd like to sharpen your skills to stay competitive in today's knowledge-driven economy, or if you'd just like to casually learn about topics that interest you, EdCast will keep you ahead. EdCast provides exclusive content generated by an eclectic community of thought leaders, gained diverse perspectives by collaborating with like-minded peers from all around the world, and become a domain expert yourself. At EdCast, we are committed to building the future of personalized learning. Ignite your thirst for knowledge and start EdCasting today. So I'll end it here and just one quick uh, history. Uh, we started in 2013 uh, when the open, when the edX went open edX in June 2013. We put up the first site back in uh, July 2013. So it's been two years of collaboration and now we are up to about 100 plus sites not all of them have been publicly announced, but that's running the open edX. And a majority of them is now starting to overlay the, the social learning network on the top of that. So with that, I'll stop here. Thank you very much.